Okay, next, I want to talk about uh, some of the services. Um, I'm going to try to uh, go quickly because I would like really to reserve some time for the analytics uh, discussion, network performance management that Steve has. So I'm going to try to cover this rapidly. So scalable and automated overlay fabric. What do I mean by that? Let me talk first about automation, the three level of automation we have into the systems, right? Number one, the fabric underlay automation. This is how you automate the build out of your BGP fabric or whatever it is, right? BGP fabric, OSPF fabric, layer two fabric. You have to automate that. And for that we have tools which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. I'm gonna talk about our own tool, our own management tool for that, but you can use Ansible at the same time. This is actually, frankly, Table stakes, it's expected these days, right? That you have, have the capability of automating a fabric. I'm gonna point out one second, in a moment, however, where I think we, um, we put a lot of effort on, which is automating in an environment where, which is a mixed environment, right? Because again, we keep showing pictures where Pluribus doesn't sit here, we'd love to sit here, but the reality is many customers are not ripping out their entire uh, spine or core layer. And automating an environment where you don't control the other side is actually challenging. We put a lot of effort uh, into the underlay automation where it's kind of free. Uh, in the sense, we give you freedom of choice, but then we have to deal with that, right? Because one guy can have ERP, the other guy can have BFD, the other guy can have BGP. All these options at the underlay need to be accounted for. So a lot of effort goes into automating an heterogeneous environment, right? Second, <clears throat> We have a level of automation which comes from, uh, I call it here, edge ports automation. Uh, the classic example of vCenter provisioning uh, VMs, attaching VMs to port groups, and then the VLAMs get provisioned, uh, the, the lags, et cetera, et cetera, provisioned. This is obvious. Right? It's, again, table stakes, right? But the interesting part is that upon provisioning the edge ports or the VM faces, facing port or, let's say, the customer workload facing ports, we automate in the backend the underlay, and this is totally transparent to the customer. So we use our fabric intelligence, the VTEP awareness, uh, the, the VPort awareness that we have discussed uh, early on, to actually create an overlay fabric which is fully automated to the customer. So the customer only has to worry about standing up a new VM, a new service, provisioning a front, a front panel port with a VLAN, and then we take care of provisioning the, un the overlay network on top. The underlay, I consider it as a day one operation to stand up your underlay network. But then there's a level of dynamicity, if you will, if you allow me the term, <laughs> when you provision your workloads and, 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 and applications. Then you need to have the overlay capable of reacting it's an event-driven automation on the underlay. Now, let me actually look at uh, these three types of automation. The underlay. So we, uh, um, Steve alluded to this tool we built. Uh, it's a fabric manager, which we call Unum. Unum Pluribus Unum Fabric Manager. This tool is actually pretty powerful in that it allows you to automate an infrastructure where it can be Pluribus Leaf and Pluribus Spine, third-party spine and Pluribus Leaf, Pluribus Spine and third-party leaf with layer two and layer three protocols, at least the, the major ones, right? Uh, the, from MST to VRP to um, uh, BFD, BGP, all these classic protocols. And you select a menu, I have a menu of options to build this underlay, right? It's not one leaf and spine, one protocol. We give you flexibility for all layer two, layer three capabilities. I just got to pick the one I intend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But if you pick the wrong one, we can change it really quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, but again, a lot of effort in automating a heterogeneous environment. But in the end, okay, it's cool, it's interesting, but it's not, it's not really unique. What is more interesting is actually what we do with the overlay, which is triggered by the way we provision edge ports. Clearly, you can use vCenter to drive from vCenter itself uh, the provisioning of VLANs and ports uh, and lags uh, 
on, uh, um, uh, on what they call it, the edge ports, uh, or it can also be manual, or you, know, you, you can have your own orchestration system, and the rest API uh, um, issue comments on the fabric. But what's really interesting is actually what we do on, um, on the overlay side. Across all the leaf, we build VTEPs, uh, and all these VTEPs uh, automatically build a mesh of tunnels. So you don't have to worry about building tunnels. You build the VTEP, the tunnels come up automatically. As soon as the moment you assign a, a VLAN to a physical port on the switch, automatically we stand up the entire L2 segment across uh, the entire infrastructure. So care, taking care of mapping VLAN to VNIs, assigning VLAN, VNIs automatically, mapping VNIs to VTEPs and then to tunnels, all this sequence is actually taken care on demand and dynamically on behalf of the customer. The customer only has to worry about provisioning the front panel port. And then once we have this sort of overlay infrastructure in place, we talked about the conversational forwarding because we have vPort awareness or endpoint awareness, so we can actually place a nice optimization in the way the traffic flows and we optimize traffic, and also we consume resources. Right? Because you won't want to consume harder resources if these conversations are really taking place. You don't want to necessarily blast uh, routes, uh, uh, host routes everywhere if uh, these conversations don't really take care of. ARP optimization we discussed, and then of course, uh, avoid air pinning, we have this Anycas gateway function associated to each subnet, uh, uh, which is also pretty interesting. Uh, so again, it looks like you moved past automation, just a question of automation. Yeah. You do have modules for Ansible and Napalm, right? Uh, Ansible. Okay. Yes, we have uh, uh, spent enormous effort uh, to, uh, on the Ansible side. Right? That's our uh, automation framework. Uh, um, and again, to be honest, our tool is mm -hmm. actually using Ansible under okay. the cover. Right? <laughs> so the language of playbooks uh, is actually what you'll find as you use our GUI. It's just GUI driven. The, uh, the, the Ansible server is built into, into our tool. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, so you built your own Ansible tower. <laughs> yes. We built a, a GUI front yeah. end to an Ansible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Two, two questions, real quick. Sure. The uh, VMware integration you had earlier, was that um, SANS NSX or just NSX VTEP integration? Or is that like a plugin and yeah. kick, just kicking your API or something? Yeah, uh, exactly. So. Um, uh, we have two levels of integration. One is uh, with the standard vCenter, okay. right? So you stand up uh, in the SXI server, the ports are provisioned. Um, with the lags, we look at the teaming configuration on the server, yeah. that basic stuff. Then you create a VM, you associate the VM to a port group, the VLANs belong to the port group are now programmed into the fabric. Yeah. That triggers uh, the automation, the VNI, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the VLAN to VNI, et cetera, uh, mapping on the, on, on the overlay. Then we have, and this is one, one realm, if you will. Yeah, then sure. we have the integration with NSX. And then you guys are hardware. That actually, we are just a traditional layer two gateway. Okay. Right? You can find it on any vendor, but this is a function that uh, um, um, uh, we have developed as well. Okay. Right? So, uh, so your OVSDB gateway. Yeah. We, yes, yeah, okay. we have an o, exactly. Yeah. We have an OVSDB gateway. We use this for ODL. Mm -hmm. We have an integration with Ericsson, one par partner for ODL. Okay. And then uh, we reuse the same facility uh, for an That thing hasn't NSX. died yet? Yeah. ODL hasn't died yet? And then uh, the yeah. second question, just <laughs> between the taps, uh, is it all unicast? Oh. I still love because, it. Because, you know, in a spine leaf, mm -hmm. maybe multicast no, no, no. problem. You can have multicast, layer two multicast, layer three multicast. Even if you have third party spine? Yes. And so you just integrate, play nice with multicast. Yes, and again, you, 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 the, uh, the beauty of, of what we're trying to accomplish is that we don't, we, wanna, we don't want to dictate the way you build your network. Sure, right? sure, sure. Imagine I go to a service provider customer which is running PIM SSM, and they say, no, you can't do it because my father, then you're out. Right, right, right? Right. You have to yeah. fit. It's about fitting. So yes, we're developing uh, all these layer three, multicast protocols, IPv6, V4 over V6 stack, all this infrastructure is the underlay. And can you unicast if you had something crappy in the middle, like for, for a spine layer that was just, or if there was no multicast, could you unicast it? Out to all of the other leaves instead of having like a multicast stream. Like okay, do you do head end, yeah. head end replication yeah, head end of logic? No. Okay. Well, head end, uh, we do head end replication yeah. for, uh, for for VXLAN. Yeah. We do right. that. Uh, yes. Right, right, yeah. That That's what you meant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. we do have head end replication, okay. of course. Okay. Yes. Cool. So, which is ingress replication? I assume you don't do any multicast optimization. No. Yeah, so I have a different variant of this question that I've been mulling over for the last okay. five minutes, <laughs> which is 
Okay, how does this differ from what NSX is doing? And I've seen some environments where people tried, for example, to mix ACI, Cisco ACI with NSX. And so I was sort of seeing VTEP and thinking, okay, no, no, this, but, but hold on. Hold well, on. let me finish the, the yeah, long winded please. question. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was sort of sounding like, okay, this is sort of like NSX with a lot of hardware mixed in physical servers, physical devices, as opposed to virtualized devices. And so is there a use case when, you, when your network is, let's say, 90% virtualized? So let me clarify. Yeah. At the fundamental level, we are complementing NSX because we run on a physical switch. Mm -hmm. right? NSX runs on an ESXi host uh, server. So we don't touch servers here at all. Servers uh, are connected to our fabric and our software only lives uh, on network switches. That's the fundamental difference, right? So we are an underlay. When NSX comes to play, we're an underlay. But all you need is a ordinary fabric underlay. You don't need all this extra yes, you, machinery. Oh, exactly. NSX uh, removes uh, some of the benefits uh, that yeah. we have. But again, you always have a mixed environment, right? I mean, network are typically mixed, right? So what you can use is NSX on a portion of the network, and then through the gateway functionality, extend the control of NSX in a way, um, or the properties of NSX through the pluribus fabric to a bare metal environment, for example. Uh, there's two ways to look at it, right? A customer wants to take advantage of NSX, and they're going to build a basic network to do that and run the whole virtualized on top. And they're going to go for the simplest of choices. Some people are doing it on ACI or other. Same in our environment. Mm -hmm. We give the added services to bring incremental value. We simplify the, uh, and automate the provisioning. Then we bring in the visibility for, for performance monitoring and other pieces. But if they want a pure, simple network, then that's what they're going to deploy. There's no value add. Where we really shine is the value add that we're providing in a mixed environment. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Peter, don't forget that some people are deploying NSX on VLANs just for micro-segmentation. Yeah. For, for parts, right. Yeah. 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 So uh, they would use v VLAN-based segments in NSX, in which case they would provide VXLAN-based yeah. transport. Exactly. Mm. You don't have to oh. run NSX with VXLAN. Yeah, I, I want to follow that up separately with you because I, I don't like NSX on VLANs. Um, it seems like that's one of the things Cisco recommends when you integrate ACI with it, and it's kind of backwards. <laughs> But well, Cisco another... does need to justify why you need ACI, but let's move on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really have only five minutes. Uh, I, I'm trying to, and yeah, I feel really awful uh, shortchanging the discussion maybe on segmentation, but really quickly, um, of course, everything I said, because the fabric is geographically independent uh, or geographically distributed, this automation is also available across uh, multiple locations, right? And we don't really have a limit of two or three, right? We actually have deployed it in uh, up to 10 locations, 10 separate locations. So it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, um, uh, partitioning? Partitioning. <laughs> oh, by the way, okay, fine. This is a quick slide. VXLAN is important to us. Is maybe the way we would recommend you to build the network because you want to have layer three as the underlay, build scalable networks. It makes total sense. But boy, we found so many customers with eight tracks, 10 racks, 12 racks. We says, why do I need to, why do you need to go to BGP or OSPF and VXLAN? Can you give me these advantages on my standard traditional layer two network? And the answer is yes. So we can build a loop-free layer two environment and still have the operational simplification and the forwarding optimizations we discussed. Of course, there's no tunnel automation in there, right? Or overlay automation everything else is available. And again, this speaks to the freedom of choice uh, of underlay and, and technology you want to mix up. Now, I'm going to end up in big trouble here because we finally talk about segmentation, right? So segmentation, uh, something very basic to begin with, right? <clears throat> so virtual network is a logical partition of the pluribus fabric. Okay? The concept hopefully is clear. We do this through the concept of VNet, which is, again, uh, short for virtual network. And the virtual uh, VNet uh, job is to group network objects. I keep using the language objects, so it's what you heard before. A VLAN is an object. A VRF is an object, right? Um, 
and you group them and you can give control to a tenant or the virtual network administrator of this set of objects. So the uh, fabric administrator is in charge of designing policies and determine what resources are associated, allocated to, uh, to which tenant. Once that is done, the VNet operator, the virtual network operator, has full control of those. Very important, the VNet is a distributed object. So the VNet is a construct which is distributed across the fabric. The very first uh, question I heard today was about VDC. Right? Although VNet is not a strict VDC, right? um, VNet is fully distributed across all the boxes. Imagine you have this top of racks, right? leaf switches. You can partition this capability and these resources that goes from ports, uh, physical ports, uh, VLANs, VNI, VRFs, uh, et cetera, v, even VTEPs. Uh, you can, uh, and, sorry, tunnels. You can also automatically and uh, instantiate tunnels on a per tenant basis. Those are your virtual network out, built out of the common infrastructure. So you can say, hey, first three ports of the first 20 switches are going to take 100 VLANs, uh, this group of VNIs, this set of VRF resources, uh, and we call it uh, application one, right? And then you can say port 7 to 51 on switch 1, 3, and 5, uh, VLAN 5 and VLAN 79, that's another virtual network. So now the administrator of the virtual network, called the VNet manager, logs into its container that manages the network, more on that in a moment, and only has a tenant view of the infrastructure. Right? But underneath, uh, we actually uh, manage through standard protocols uh, the separation and isolation. Again, we don't invent anything new. So as you go into configuration of your routing stuff, your configuration has unique semantics per switch, per tenant. Per tenant, yes. So how do you synchronize, desynchronize? How do you configure it from any device? How does it work? Yeah. So. Um, we can associate a virtual router per tenant, right? And uh, uh, the virtual router is effectively a container that runs uh, on uh, our uh, OS, uh, runs on our switch. And this can be per tenant. I don't need to synchronize it, uh, right? Then there are objects which are allocated uh, by the fabric administrator, like VLANs, right? Which VLANs you can use uh, is determined by the network administrator. But once you log into your system, you only have a view of your resources. And in these resources, also you have routing resources. But tenant, in your definition, is VNet object. It's not local to the switch, right? Yeah, it's an object which is distributed across N switches, right? So when things are common, I understand how you provision it. When they're unique per switch, per tenant. OK, then if they're unique, you have a level of flexibility of uh, configuring it, right? Because you have your own virtual router as a tenant. So you can actually change um, some routing policies or uh, security policies uh, on a per tenant basis. Do I have to be logged in into this particular device, or it could be done on any device and then synchronized? Oh, right how, how you're asking how it's done. OK, yeah. we have the concept of VNet Manager, which I'm going to examine in literally okay. two slides. I'll show you how you manage your environment okay, in a moment. Uh, attributes of the VLAN, again. With one command, you provision a VLAN across N switches. You don't have to go into every switch and allocate the resources separately. You can do it from, um, uh, with one command from any switch. Um, independent management, right? So you can provision, every tenant can provision its own resources, the VLANs, the tunnels, the VRouters, et cetera. You have the full 4K VLAN ID available. So there's a constant of VLAN reuse. Coca-Cola tenant can have. Uh, uh, VLAN uh, 1000 to uh, 2000, and same as same for Pepsi, which lives in a, in, a, in an adjacent tenant, tenant blue, for example. Um, How and then do you separate tenant by physical ports on the switches? We can do physical ports. Yes, okay. we can also do physical ports, uh, or there is also the concept of shared ports. At that point, uh, is uh, the VNI which uh, is mapped to the tenant, which uh, allows you to at the data plane level, separate the VLANs belonging to two tenants. Okay. So we have shared ports and also physical port separation. How about buffer space? 
So buffer space, we don't carve a buffer, but we have QoS policies which are per tenant. We can apply QoS policies per tenant. But potentially one tenant can overload another one, since but, buffer. But we can running. reserve bandwidth. We do reserve bandwidth. When I say QoS policy, you can have bandwidth reservation on a per customer, uh, on a per tenant base or per virtual network basis. Now, so you are doing basic policing at ingress, yes. which doesn't prevent buffer from being overflown. Yeah. That's why we call them noisy tenants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> really quick, one important concept uh, is actually how you manage uh, this tenant. Right? So the tenant manager is um, effectively just a portal right? uh, to manage and monitor the resources of a tenant. When I say just a portal, I really mean there is no state into the VNet manager. The state is all distributed in the fabric, which is actually uh, one of the interesting uh, aspects uh, from a resiliency and high availability point of view. The VNet manager, however, once you log into this portal through SSH or REST, if you will, uh, you have a tenant view of the network. So you only see the resources assigned to, um, to the particular tenant. And again, very important, this is a stateless container which can sit on uh, a pluribus switch or can sit also on a server. Because it's stateless, this container can die. The node hosting the container die there is no impact on the network because it's just a stateless container, just a portal. You lose connectivity to your environment. So it's not traffic impacting, but I can recreate this container anywhere in the fabric because the state is in the fabric. The knowledge of what a VNet is is distributed in the fabric. And I can recreate this container on a physical host, a server host, or I can recreate it uh, on another switch in the fabric. Because it's the stateful nature of this container allows me to destroy and recreate them in a matter of few seconds on any part of the uh, switching fabric. Now this, a physical node, a physical server, or a physical switch. Now this is the per tenant manager. Per tenant manager, yes. And you have okay. N of this manager. Not the tenant manager. <laughs> Manager of tenants. No, no, no. This is the, tenant <laughs> okay. man, the, the virtual and, network manager. Okay. Yes. So, what are the limitations with regard to with regards to latency? And you're going into consensus-based distributed system. So you're as slow as your slowest contributor. What are the limitations? In in terms of uh, configuring. So you need all hundred members to say yes or no, right? Yes. It's logical. And so if ninety-ninth member takes half a minute to reply. Your yeah, group. there are timers uh, uh, that once they expire, again, you, you roll back an operation, you don't perform it. Uh, uh, but if everything uh, goes well and you don't have these sort of latency issues or, or a node that goes offline, it's uh, near instantaneous. It's uh, the amount of time it takes to exchange packets. Uh, on single LAN, for sure. You said you can extend it to another geographical location. Yes. What's your recommendation All, with mean, regards to Okay, you mean network latency? Yeah. So um, we tested, uh, there's a customer in China which has two locations uh, separated by, I think, 800 kilometers, right? There are three data centers, 800 kilometers. There's another customer in Europe which has five locations between Portugal and Spain. And uh, the maximum diameter, I think, is in the order of uh, 800, 900 kilometers in that case as well. Yeah, and so in terms, of milliseconds, in terms of milliseconds, we think uh, anywhere between 80 to 100 milliseconds is, uh, um, uh, is something we feel very comfortable. RTT or One Direction? RTT. Beyond that, we really have not uh, had a chance to, uh, to, to experiment. But again, 80 milliseconds cover a uh, pretty wide uh, geographical distance. Again, this, this manager, uh, this VNet manager, is also fully highly available, again, uh, you can provision the container in active standby mode. If you don't want to lose access any second, you can provision two containers in not standby mode, or you can resort uh, to uh, the previous mode I described. If the manager goes away for some reason, you just lose access to the network, you have to recreate it on the network. But again, there are customers which cannot accept that, right? So we also have the ability to synchronize these containers. I'm, uh, I want to, do we, Steve, do we want to, I'll keep going. 
Last concept here is we, we discussed it, but I want to highlight that. Now we have some um, interesting degree of uh, integration with this center. We do something which is, let's say, standard in the sense many other vendors do, which is provisioning uh, uh, ports and VLANs. But I think what's interesting, and I think we discussed that, is that we actually use VMware provisioning, driven provisioning, as an event to provision our, uh, our overlay fabric completely automatically. So we extend a VLAN configuration across the tunnel. And if you actually happen to have a pluribus leaf and pluribus spine, and there is no overlay, we provision the VLAN even on the spine switches, end-to-end -end provisioning of, uh, of network segments. We also have provisioning of Malticas for VSAN, uh, for VSAN transport. And uh, uh, we have just added uh, uh, support for uh, NSX uh, layer 2 gateway uh, in the fabric. So again, it's another option that you can use to uh, provision VTEPs and definitely extend the NSX uh, um, um, cloud, if you will, to bare metal workloads. This was my last uh, slide. Then the partitioning? Sun partitioning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is the question of partition? So, first of all, if your cluster is 100 nodes and 50 of them unavailable, yeah. most probably you won't take any actions. Exactly. So, we have to evict a node that uh, doesn't respond, right? If okay. it's half of your network. If you okay, you have, you have five locations, or let's say yeah. simply, you have two locations. Location. 10 nodes here, 10 nodes here. The link between them goes down. What happens next? So you're supposed to build your network with high availability and resiliency. Oh. Uh, <laughs> if that's yeah. the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, we. Well, we, you, you thought you did. The carrier told you you did. <laughs> yeah. So in that case, <laughs> well, with high availability, no, no, no. you All decrease the probability of failure. The you network, don't bring it the to fabric zero. fabric continues to work. What you cannot do is provision the fabric. Okay. Okay. So on either side, if there's any partition. Yeah. Again, look. <laughs> the like I said, the the the, the fabric, the, what we call fabric, um, is nothing to do with the network. It's a, an over it's a logic, control okay. plane. Yeah. Yes, sure. You mm -hmm. interrupt that communication. The rest of the network uh, goes right because it's again it's an application that is disjointed mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the BGP, the OSPF, the spanning. Mm -hmm. So the the important aspect is, look, you're losing your one connection. You have other. You have massive issues, uh, uh, mm -hmm. right? Other than losing pluribus control plane. What we <laughs> want to ensure is that uh, pluribus control plane non-availability for certain nodes is not imp impeding the normal functioning of the network. Your it's almost like table. So sure, I can, I can forward traffic yes, through absolutely. what is now two so different you go fabrics. into read-only yes. mode. But mm -hmm. you cannot issue a configuration yeah. which span across the two networks. Yeah, but okay. what if I only lost you know, one node? I mean, I have a majority there in the fabric is because one node fell out. We, we wait. We wait until you restore that node. Again. So I've got to have, basically, I've got to have 100% of the fabric, 100% connected, or I can't you do cannot, any changes yes. to the fabric. Yes. So this is how it's consent an atomic algorithms work. That's an, okay. If you're not comfortable because you have 100 nodes, a good strategy is creating two fabric of 50 nodes, <laughs> right? So, so, so you fun. guys are always going to be consistent, always. You must yes. have consistency. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. That's one of okay. the, the, the premise of this architecture. We do recommend, for example, customers who have a leaf and spine. Put the leaf in one, in one the spine in other. Customers who have different pods, put one pod in one management network, because anyway, the, inter the intercommunication happens through routers. So, so you, you would manage the spine as an entity yeah. and your leaves as an exactly. entity. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the design options. You want to have everything in one basket, then something goes wrong, right? Mm. Even when you do software upgrade, you can upgrade software on the entire fabric, but you may not want to do that, right? You want to take well, care of leaves. I mean, if you'd advise people to have, you know, possibly, leaves as a domain and spines as a domain, where the heck is the DCI use case where you'd want to spread that out geographically? The, the DCI is about extending layer two domains uh, across. Oh, no, uh, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> across five locations, across 100 milliseconds. Yeah, that works really well. It'll be well. fine, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Got it. So you, you're doing that just for people who want to do stretch layer two. That's really the, yeah. the big use case. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you can't stop some people. <laughs> they have to learn the hard way. <laughs> hmm. All right, good enough for now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, more questions?
<laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Interaction with the routing stack. Interaction with the routing stack. So you provide the base OS. Routing stack oh, runs yeah. an application, right? Routing stack for us is a container, right? So I mentioned that before on, um, on a switch. You can run uh, Quagga or FRR instance, uh, right? Um, uh, and it operates as a, as a container, on the, uh, a physical container on the, on the switch. And you can have multiple of these containers. So what is the boundary between application and the base? It's a separate, uh, the, the, the fabric runs in a separate process. 